the Muay Thai Guys podcast, episode number 138. The Muay Thai Guys are back at it again. It's good to see your beautiful face again, Sean. Yes, I agree. It's always good to see your face as well. And uh, yeah, we had a kind of impromptu podcast, uh, at least topic, at least because uh, we originally had an interview with Miru Nakamoto, who's a gangster in the Muay Thai scene. Uh, was part of CSA Gym for a while. And I know she transitioned to MMA and had a bunch of ups and downs in her career. I was looking forward to chat with her, but something came up. So now we're hopping on and just, uh, oh, I'm listening to ourselves on YouTube. Don't know if you heard that. But uh, yeah, excited to, uh, to jump into this though, because uh, it's always an interesting topic. And I know that we've talked about in the past about creating our own fighting style and how it's kind of evolved throughout our career and how we're always adding or subtracting certain things to our fighting style. So, uh, yeah, excited to jump into it, but, uh, I heard you got staff, bro. That's sad. It's sad times. What are you doing? It's hard to stay out of the gym uh, in one way. Uh, in another way, I feel like Khalil might've chipped a bone off in my elbow. Uh, Khalil. he wasn't ready <laughs> we were we were just drilling right and uh we had this just quick moment where i was just like easy for like a like ready for a light kick mm -hmm. he returned it and you know just that like snapping motion of like when you don't resist and yeah. it snaps back yeah i felt like maybe something went in my elbow so mm -hmm. i literally couldn't move my arm but i was still going to the gym and making it worse and worse so kind of like when you felt like you were getting burnt out and you were just doing everything at the same time and life just forced you <laughs> into it. That's how this one felt. I was messaging you about it and you're like, yeah, man, life will force you into it sometimes. So that's exactly what I think happened. Like I was uh, in the, I was going to the gym and I was just throwing my jab and it felt like I had like, I'm glad it was just staff. It felt like I had a lump inside my armpit and I'm like, oh my God, maybe one of my like lymph nodes is like swollen and I'm having like a real immune response. But yeah, it was just a little pimple inside there. And I'm like, ah, fuck. I went up to Eddie. I'm like, I should leave. And he's like, yeah, thank you for pointing it out. So yeah, I just did a full round of antibiotics. You know how lovely those are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got my probiotics at the same time. And, uh, yeah, I'm getting back to the gym today. It feels good. Everything's all cleaned up. So I'm like a lot more healed up and fresh and excited to get back in the gym right now. Yeah, like you said, life has a way of just smacking you in the face and telling you to slow the fuck down sometimes. And so uh, hopefully that helped with your elbow injury, gave it enough time to heal. So this way you can kind of like go back full force. And I'm sure you had a uh, good quality of time away from the gym, just being able to rest, recharge, do a little work here and there. So sometimes a forced rest, is uh the best type of rest because otherwise you'll just continue until you burn out and break something down you know <laughs> yeah for sure and i spent a lot of time just like stretching and doing strength and conditioning just work from don you know just going to the regular gym cleaning up after myself and whatnot just i just didn't want to be clinching with people and going skin to skin while because we do clinching every day and you know it's 20 minutes 30 minutes sometimes at a time so i don't want to be sweating on top of someone else especially in a spot that you can't really cover like in mm -hmm. our we have three people fighting this weekend on Muay hardcore and super champ so it's cool that everyone's staying active I i'm definitely getting the itch myself on <laughs> despite doing all this work you see myself wearing a rib curl hat right now i feel like a surfer because uh, I didn't know, but you can actually surf here in Phuket. I didn't think the waves would ever get big enough. Oh, yeah, but like just because of the wind and it's rainy season and stuff or? Yeah, like legit waves, like uh, maybe, you know, not huge, but at, you, you'll you get like a, a, a close to 10 foot wave, like like six to 10, 10 foot waves that you can actually get inside and and ride. So Epic, brah. Gonna catch the major yeah. swells, bro. <laughs> well, that's sweet. That'll be a good time to. Uh, that's, I feel like that's well, surfing a wipes you the fuck out. Like just if you're not used to it, like just getting the board out and like trying to uh, get into a prime surf position and just doing it over and over again it wipes you out. But it's a good uh, relaxation type of thing, uh, just sitting out in the in the sea or the ocean. So maybe I'll have to swim by Phuket, do some surfing, do some training. And uh, yeah, because the water here in Copenhagen is still very still warm. You know how it is. 
Yeah, you have to be on a specific coast because we have really calm ones. I actually wanted to get like a paddle board uh, because the water by our beach is so still. But then on the other coast, that's where it gets like r slammed with the wind. It's like right in a in a uh, like a low gulf. Mm. So it's 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 pretty uh, cape. Sorry, yeah. inside like a cape. So it's pretty sweet. What have you been up to? Um, same shit, different day kind of thing. Been uh, keeping up my strength training, uh, Don Heatrick style. Uh, this week is a heavy week, which is always fun, um, but it's also super challenging, obviously. And uh, but I'm excited to get into it and uh, crush those workouts. Been filming some uh, fight like workouts, filming fighters' body workouts, getting some training in, uh, finding the right balance between things, and just trying to. Uh, we, we like I had this conversation with Liz uh, yesterday. Like we're we're in our well, we haven't gotten our visa yet, our education visa yet. It's in the works, but once we do, it's pretty much locking us in here for nine months. And so we're trying to come up with like essentially a nine month plan of like some of the things that we want to accomplish, some of the things we want to do. We want to travel around Thailand. We want to see a war with Tana Gym in uh, Birdie Ram. We want to come to Phuket. We want to do that kind of stuff. And so we're trying to just like make sure because the island, as you know, um, it's really quiet right now. There's not too much to do. You live on a fucking island. And so we want to make sure that we're staying relatively like spontaneous and keeping things new and not just getting into too much of a uh, – just a static day to day. But fortunately, we both work online. We both have a lot of uh, activities to do in regards to Muay Thai, yoga, just working out. So that keeps us in line. But in regards to like, we're so used to traveling, man. Like, this is the longest we've ever been in one spot. Liz has been here for over a year now, like straight, just on this island for a year now. Uh, I've been in Thailand for a year now. And I have a fever, man. Yeah, for, for real though. And so we're trying to just figure out ways to uh, spice things up because with coronavirus and everything, as I'm sure a lot of people are dealing with, it's uh, it's limiting your ability to do certain things, especially travel. And travel has been such a, a huge part of our lives because what travel helps with me is it gives me uh, like deadlines. Oh, I'm going to Greece to host a Muay Thai retreat. I have to get this shit done before I go. Now I don't have any of those like hard deadlines of like, oh, I need to fucking like do this before I go. So I have to kind of like create these uh, new deadlines in my head and uh, figure out different ways to feed that travel itch without having to deal with leaving the country. Because if I leave the country, then I can't come back in. So uh, yeah, just just kind of brainstorming, just working, just uh, doing the same same stuff, you know, fortunately, uh, yeah, life is still good here in Thailand. I always talk to my family back in the States and, uh, with winter coming up, it always sounds like, sounds like the numbers are going up with COVID and things are closing up again and that kind of stuff. And so I'm staying grateful and grounded, uh, where, where I'm at. And, uh, yeah. Oh, another piece of news. I got my laptop back that was stolen from me not too long ago. I don't think I mentioned this on the last podcast. My house was broken into twice and my laptop was stolen. I found it on a Facebook uh, group, someone trying to uh, sell it. So I bought it <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's how it goes. But yeah, things are, uh, things are working out, studying Thai, all that kind of shit. And uh, yeah, I'm glad we're doing this like consistently. It's been fun to do this podcast and uh uh, full disclosure, we've one of the reasons that I feel like I haven't been doing the podcast is because I've, there's been like technical issues with the podcast that just require just monotonous, tedious online work that I'm not a fan of. And so that's kind of been holding me back. But now that we got hopefully the stream on Spotify is automatically updated our cover photo and everything is updated. Everything's updated. Um, so we should be good to go. So super excited about that. And uh, yeah, man, that's where I'm at. I just got a notification as we're talking about that. And our Patreon page just launched. They just approved us. So uh, yeah, we, we have the link up now. Patreon.com slash Muay Thai guys. The question, the Q&A section has been getting rather long. So we just want to give priority to the people that are on the Patreon. So it's 100% that you get your question answered or you have your name featured and things like that. Or if you just want to support and make sure that we're doing this every single week and 
keeping it ad free. So all those technical difficulties and stuff like that will be, uh, you know, we'll spend our time on them and making sure that it's the best experience that we can have. Sean and I were just talking about how we're going to end up having like the light side and the dark side since the theme <laughs> of my website and my branding is there's like light blue color and he has the red color for us to kind of upgrade our packages to, to, to use like professional camera equipment for the, for the videos and stuff. And I think that'll look pretty sweet having the contrast between the two. Yeah. We're leveling up, man. Just, uh, the, the consistency of the podcast and like people, uh, when we're doing this live here on YouTube, we have 44 people watching right now and a bunch of comments and everything. So it, it gives us that much more, uh, motivation and inspiration to keep this thing going. And for all the listeners as well, thank you guys for listening. So let's get into the main topic today, which is creating your fight style and, like I said earlier on, I love this topic because once you think you know your style, you learn something different, and then you add that wrinkle to your style, and it's consistently evolving. And I remember talking to one of our old trainers, Bao, who has over 300 fights, and like I have 35 fights, you have over 50 fights, I think now, but we're still like considered beginners in a sense to like the ties because we only have like a tenth of their fights. And so there's still a lot for us to uh, fall into in regards to our fighting style and things to learn and things to try to implement in certain fights and see what really fits. So I guess before we go into each fighting style, what's let's just go over our fighting styles. What 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 would you when people ask you like Paul, like how do you fight? What's your fighting style? How do you explain it to them? It's changed so much over the years. I, I used to just be more of even I that's the way I was featured on Lawrence's channel too, is like a fighter's fighter style, mm -hmm. <laughs> meaning someone that heavily relies on conditioning and toughness and kind of a like a gritty fighting style. And I think that it complemented me being a little bit longer. So I, I felt like I used to just have like this pressure style that's more endurance heavy and eventually i'd break guys and once i reached that professional level i had to really take a couple looks at it i've talked about this on prior episodes how i've spent the last year and a half or two like really completely redefining my style i, I would call it more of a femur style now uh definitely more of like a tricky style more feints and fakes and trying to stay long but I do also enjoy the clinch. So I like that transitionary style between uh, being like a tricky fighter on the outside. And then if we are in the pocket for me to go more into a clinch fighting style. Mm -hmm. How about yourself? Yeah, my, mine has evolved over time as well. When I initially started, we talked in the last podcast that uh, I started in boxing and I used to play baseball. So my my hands were, have always been at the forefront of uh, my fighting style. And although I still utilize my hands and I still try to focus on my boxing in a fight because I know that they work, I've much more rounded out my game to be a little bit more complete with uh, more competence in the clinch, more uh, outside striking with my kicks, uh, mixing in some elbows and knees as well. I would say uh, I'm typically more of a pressure fighter. I like to be moving forward, but I like to force my opponent to throw strikes so I can counter. So it's like a, a aggressive counter fighter in a way. And I like to throw a lot of combinations, punches and low kicks, Sitman Chai style and uh, Dutch style in a way. And uh, then I also fight Southpaw a good amount of the time now as well because of the angles and just the opportunities that are available as a southpaw as opposed to an orthodox fighter so yeah it's still still putting the pieces together but essentially aggressive uh dutch kickboxing style mixed in with technical southpaw style and i, I try to uh, blend the two depending on how the 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 feel of the fight is how my opponent is reacting to certain things and just kind of go with the flow but it's been fun to uh, experiment it's been fun to uh try new things i remember when i first decided I i've been trying to train southpaw for a while like uh, since the early stages of my career i was always like messing around with southpaw but i never felt comfortable enough to like fight like the fight southpaw and then when i had my first fight southpaw when i decided i was going to fight southpaw 
um, it was actually on the same card as you uh, in Samui. And I fought like a really clean fight. I was like, oh, wow, like I can actually do this. And so now I'm trying to find the balance between like, all right, I can fight pretty well in both stances. So now I need to figure out like, all right, like, but what stance do I fight in? Do I just flow? Do I see what's open? Or do I have more of a structured idea of like when I should be fighting in one stance or when I should be fighting into the other? Because right now um, I just kind of flow naturally between the two depending on what my opponent gives me. But uh, yeah, it's always an experiment in trying to figure out what works the best, what feels the best, uh, what feels the most fun. And I'll say Southpaw is just so much fun, man, because like usually the, the person doesn't know uh, the angles that you can you can get as a Southpaw and just chucking the left kick over and over again. It's like almost like cheating. It's just like hitting the same button in a video game, just throwing the fucking left kick. And like most people don't know how to defend it, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's what I started off with, and I haven't learned the secrets until you know, in, until the more recent years, and and being in the pros to have to like really figure them out. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that you joined the dark side. Uh, yes, me too. It's been a it's been a long time coming. So let's go into uh, the typical Muay Thai styles to kind of break down each one, and you as a listener can kind of take bits and pieces of each style and figure out what. Is your style now you can either fall into one of these categories or be a blend of them all um i know i'm a blend of a couple and we'll go into it in, in a minute but i think the the main idea that we want to get across here is that there are basically six styles that you'll typically see in competition or in sparring and so being familiar with them and knowing their their strengths and their weaknesses is going to be key for you as a fighter uh, as, as yourself as a fighter. So, you know, if you're a Moy Mat fighter, which is more of like aggressive boxing uh, style fighter, that it comes with pros and cons. Or if your opponent is a Moy Mat fighter, how to fi fight that type of fighter. So, we'll jump into the first one. And the first one is just one I said, uh, Moy Mat, which is an aggressive fighter. And typically, Mat means like punch. And so, it's an aggressive boxing style fighter and usually has that Sitman child style that I was saying is the punches and low kicks. And I'm definitely a fan of it, but it's a kind of low scoring in the traditional sense of tie scoring in Western uh, world. This can be a really high scoring thing because it, it typically is more volume with the punches and the low kicks, but in the, in the tie side of the world, uh, this is looked at as a lesser skilled fighter, but more, aggressive and pure just grunt style of fighting yeah it's more entertaining for the crowd for sure and i think that if you paint a picture uh with this type of style that you you can still get the decision wins here in thailand um you know that they do score your body language and how you're breaking a fighter down so oftentimes that is how they do win on points if they don't get the knockout oftentimes it is a more like finish heavy style mm -hmm. But if you can show visibly that you're doing damage to the leg, so initially it won't score too much because you're breaking the body down, you're hitting them to the head. But if they're surviving and they can ride with the punches and the kicks the way that the ties do, it, it doesn't score high. However, if you do see visible damage, like they're trying to check the kick and you can see that the leg is starting to get fried up, that they're starting to get rocked, their balance is broken. And then uh, a lot of times they'll switch it up and go high, go for that head kick after, you know, they start reaching for the low kick. And mm -hmm. it's more of an exciting style. I think it's the style of the crowd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because uh, the, the main fighter that comes to mind for me when you say more Matt, and uh, aggressive styles, Pornsene, uh, yeah. Sidman Chai. And uh, unfortunately, he... Uh, Murder someone is now in jail, but uh, he when he was I, I was able to train with him in Evolve uh, MMA, and I know that he had a good reputation at Sitman Chai Gym. And his if you ever watch any of his interviews on like Humans of Fighting and uh, other outlets, you see that he just is in it to entertain. He's in it to uh, put the pressure on, have an exciting fight, and just to throw down and see who's like the tougher fighter out of the two. And that can definitely uh, benefit you in the regards of getting a lot more fans getting a lot more exposure because usually your fights are a little bit more exciting but on the other side of things you're usually going to take a beating in order to give a beating and so the there's a balance between the two and i, I was much 
uh, I was very much this style early on. I was just like, you know, I'm going to be tougher than everyone. I'm just going to punch everyone in the face. I'm going to move forward and I'm just going to prove my, my power and my toughness through that. And it worked for a while, but then you get to a point where everyone's as tough as you, you know, like everyone is like good and everyone's a fighter. And so you get to this point where you're just kind of like colliding and you realize at least I realized after I had my arm broken and a couple other tough fights, I'm like, oh, I can like I can get hurt and like not continue fighting if I get like seriously hurt enough. And so that made me contemplate my fighting style, which made me move to more of a Moy femur style, which is the second style we'll be discussing, which is much more of a, a technical style fighter. You think of guys like Samar Payakarun or Sanchai or uh Namsak Noy was Namsak Noy. Yep, I, I keep trying to. Uh, I can't. We watch him on one. Uh, Panpayak, Panpayak. He's a he's a uh, great femur style too, and it's just a beautiful style to watch. And that that's like what Thais think is like true Muay Thai is a Muay femur style because it's beautiful, it's technical, it's well balanced, it's good control, and it's not super chaotic, but everything is just super clean and sharp. Uh, one fight that comes to mind, if you want like a perfect example of the Moy Mat style, and uh, <laughs> uh, pretty much if you want to frame it and just see one of the more exciting fights, I, it's it reminded me because I watched Pacorn fight this weekend. It was mm -hmm. Porn Sine versus uh, Pacorn, who is now PK Sanjay Jim. And that's one of the most wild fights ever wow. where they're throwing their. <laughs> They're sim simultaneously throwing hooks at each other, just like hitting each other. Like who's going to fall first? Who is the tougher fighter? You know, mm -hmm. like flipping a coin and saying like, all right, we're throwing down in the middle of the ring right now. And it it's really interesting to see that style play out against uh, like a, a less experienced foreigner. Uh, our friend from Samui was uh, fighting him this weekend, Ahmed. He's a Zambian fighter. Uh, he was on the IFMA team there. And he fought against Bakhorn, who was a bit shorter. So he was trying to play that like long switch kick, long teep game. And Bakhorn, all he did was just low kick him, like just to test his shins, test his defense for the entire first round. Didn't do much. Uh, Ahmed did great. And then in the second round, that pressure 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 and and what that pressure does sometimes is it makes you feel like you need to do something right like to get this person off you so like you switch kick a lot you teep and then at some point they get inside the range and then you have to make a decision and at this point Ahmed made the decision to say like ah fuck it I'm gonna throw an elbow you know like a heavy elbow instead of you know stuffing him or staying long he got backed into a corner and then Pacorn, all that pressure, all that pressure. He's like, dude, uh, come on, throw something, throw something. He was just looking for something to come out. And then he split the elbow and he got his head off center line and got the knockout. So I feel like that's usually like where the clean, like higher IQ, kind of what you said, that like pressure style where you're also looking to counter. That's where it really comes out, especially against less experienced guys where they're trying to be very technical. And then you you give them so much pressure that they're not thinking correctly. And then you just catch them. Uh, on a counter while you're pressuring them yeah my training buddy uh back in new york christmas seri is also fights in this way as well mm -hmm. where it's just like terminator style walking forward uh good defense good balance really good foundation but he's forcing you to make a move so this way you open up and then he can counter and uh i'm a, definitely a big fan of that style and then when it comes to the, like the more femur style a lot of it has to do with not getting hit not just moving forward for the sake of moving forward and just being evasive and trying to avoid as much damage as possible. And essentially just trying to make your opponent look stupid. Uh, like just, you look so much better because you're in that much more control of your technique, your body, and just the, the tempo of the fight. The, the issue with most, uh, femur fighters or not the issue, but, uh, their, their kryptonite, I guess you could say is technically clinch. Uh, usually when, you see like when Sanchai has lost um, a lot of it has to do with guys like Pechpunchu or Sakadao or even Fabio Pinka, who's like the only foreigner, I think to beat him. Uh, they utilized the clinch a lot and they swarmed on him. Even when Kevin Ross fought Sanchai and he did a good job uh, the times that 
uh, Ross was winning was when he was clinching. But if he stayed on the outside, then it's a lot tougher to, to play that game because the ties are so good at playing their game. And, uh, yeah, it, it's a hard game to win, you know. Yeah, what, what I really enjoyed about what Namsak Noy said to me is that, you know, I, I'm a female fighter, but when I fought Sanchai, I switched to Moy Kao to break him down. And if you are more of a fighter like himself, I, that's what I like about this is that what I described, maybe it's, it, it was taken from him telling me that, but why I like being on the outside, being long, and then I also enjoy when the game gets close so that way I, I can clinch is just having that second option because I feel like if, if you're like one dimensional and then you're, you know, you're facing your kryptonite, then you have no defense left, right? So for him to feel like he's a femur fighter, but maybe not as fast, right? Like uh, he was a lot taller than Sanchai. Sanchai felt like maybe he was too quick because Namsik is like, his femur but it's like like slickness kind of like in the pocket like mm -hmm. transitioning like really he's like very smooth versus sanchez is just like just so fast like shoo -shoo, shoo -shoo, just mm -hmm. in and out right so if he can like what stops speed is like if you tie up it it doesn't matter how fast you are when you tie up it's everything is just based on technique skill and leverage and that's how he was able to break them down over those five rounds so i would say if anything if you were to form any style like between the two like what what Namsak Noy uh described there I think is like that perfect symbiotic relationship well Namsak Noy's record was something insane like 285 10 and 5 or, or something crazy so if uh you're gonna listen to anybody and talking about fighting style and what are is the perfect blend uh he might be the go-to guy to listen to and the thing is like Namsak Noy obviously is a gifted athlete and an amazing uh, fighter but he was just like super technical and smart he was just really uh intellectual when it came to how to fight and how to win against certain fighters and that's essentially what a femur style is it's just like being smarter uh being more technical and just being able to play the game in the way that you know is that gonna win you win you the game and in that regard you, you mentioned moy cow we can move to moy cow next uh that's essentially a pressure fighter similar to moy mat but the main difference is you're trying to land those knees you're trying to suffocate your opponent you're trying to just grab onto them latch onto them and essentially break their will because i know uh one thing that moy cow fighters are are known for at least during training is like just unstopping relentless knees on the bag and you you you're pushing you're constantly pushing and pushing and pushing because in a fight that's what you're trying to do you're trying to break your opponent just by swarming on them just by landing knees to the body and if you've ever been hit with knees to the body you'll know that it can really uh deteriorate your your morale and just really just uh go go down and up and down and up and it's just a constant change i remember seeing a fight here in phuket actually um yes all right it's working uh and sylvie was actually fighting and then when i saw her opponent i got really excited because it was the one that leah fought at one of our camps and she's a very beautiful like femur style fighter very skilled very graceful white crew that she came out with and you're excited to see this like clash of styles of like that one person that moves around the ring and tries to be tricky while the other person is trying to suffocate them and in the first two rounds i was like man this is going to be a hard fight for sylvie but you can see in the first two rounds even though the girl wasn't letting sylvie in and when they did tie up she still had the power and the quickness to just kind of tie up really quickly and to avoid any type of damage but you can see by like round three and four that pressure and just how much endurance it takes to get away from someone that's that relentless and trained to take that much damage at first um it, it just weighed on her and it slowed her down that her her footwork got slower and then there's this like point where that barrier breaks like where the kick comes but it no longer stops the moy cow fighter in their tracks and they bust through that like defensive barrier of the kicks coming the teeps coming and they're, they're not powerful enough anymore and then they just break through and then that's where they like really start working i feel like that style starts to become increasingly effective over 
that like three, like round number three, four and going into five. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's where uh, they start to push on the the gas pedal and really try to put the pressure on and make you doubt your cardio, make you doubt your will to want to be there. And if you're able to blend your Muay Cow style with a Muay Sok style, which is a elbow fighting essentially, then it's like super diverse inside the, the clinch and the, the inside part of the game, the close range part of the game. And it could be super dangerous for anyone you're fighting because if you have d- dangerous knees and elbows, um, obviously punches and kicks hurt a lot, but knees and elbows have different, just dif- they feel different. They feel different. When you get hit with an elbow, you notice. When you get hit with a knee to the ribs, you fucking notice. And uh, and so if you're able to consistently put that pressure on your opponent and land these dangerous blows, it can really just – you can just have a psychological advantage over your opponent and really just instill some fear, instill some doubt, and just concern uh, in them about like, oh, shit, like this is going to – especially if they know you as a fighter before the fight even starts and then they know like, oh, shit, they're just going to pressure me and clinch me and knee and elbow me. I have to be ready for that. That You're already in their head in that sense, you know, because you, you, it's like uh, like Khabib and Justin Gaethje are fighting this weekend, and both of those fighters are known for their unrelentless wrestling well, – Gaethje, not necessarily of his wrestling, but the unrelentless style of just constant, just for pressure and just, just beasting the, the guy in front of them. And whoever's fighting them has to know that like they're going to be in for a war one way or another. And so they got to be ready for that kind of stuff. So that little bit of a, a mind advantage early on, just knowing that when someone fights you, that they're going to have to like fucking bring it, uh, can give you a mental advantage of your, yourself of, of extra confidence just going into a fight as well. Yeah, it's similar to wrestling. Like I, I try to make that comparison all the time. Muay Thai is, or uh, clinches to Muay Thai as wrestling is to MMA. You can force yourself upon the opponent. You can kind of dictate where the fight takes place because if you're a striker going against a wrestler, you have to think about every strike you throw and being taken down. So same thing with the clinch fighter. Like Every strike you throw, you can think about that. They're going to catch and then force the clinch or they're going to block the shot and then force the clinch rather than staying at the end of your punches. So you, there's nothing worse than trying to get someone off you, hitting them, and then you, you can't just think like, oh, I kicked them. And that's the end when you're fighting another technical fighter. Usually they're trying to figure out like, oh, how do I enter? This person doesn't think that way they they absorb and then they enter or they defend and then they enter so it, it's a style they have to build over like thousands of repetitions of of knees and hours in the clinch to condition the body to be able to withstand that type of style to to be able to absorb to be able to condition the body to be really strong and you know if, if there's one person that's spending hours in the clinch and it's and throwing thousands of knees that conditioning comes into play when it's a fight and it's round number three, four, and five. And then both people are clinching. One person is going to utilize a lot less energy than the other. And if they're throwing a thousand knees a day, they're going to be able to throw that many more inside the fight. Yeah, exactly. And then if you put together the elbow fighter and the knee fighter, then you got the Moy plum fighter. And plum means clinch and tie. And essentially, this is just a, a beast of a clinch fighter. And these are guys like Diesel Noy. Uh, Pesh Poon Chu, uh, both guys are just legends in their own rights. And when it comes down to it, they're just the ones who swarm on you and then also have the technical and strength advantage inside the clinch. A lot of them can decide if they're going to knee you, if they're going to elbow you, or if they're just going to outmaneuver and sweep you. And so it can be really, I know me personally, like I, I don't like fighting clinch fighters. I do not like fighting clinch fighters. Um, th- there's pros and cons to it, obviously, because like if you know you're fighting a clinch fighter, there's certain tactics and uh, strategies that you can implement. But you also, like we were just saying, if you know that it's a clinch fighter, they're going to be moving forward and trying to grab a hold on to you in one form or another. So it can have that little bit of an advantage if you don't like being inside the clinch. And the thing, though, about being a clinch fighter is that you have to be ready to take some damage to get inside the clinch because usually it's not going to be just as easy as like your opponent allowing you to grab onto their neck you need to actually work your way in and usually take a kick or a couple punches in order to uh, cover that distance grab a hold of your opponent and start to do the work yeah it's funny i i can see already with you know i've only been here for a month at the gym and i can already see you know when you have a certain training partners you know what they're going to bring like this training session and i can see with 
Eddie when I strike from the outside and then he comes inside with that like Dutch kickboxing style that I try to stuff it with the clinch and he knows that I try to stuff it with the clinch. So what he does is like he immediately tries to go for trips. Uh, like whether he gets it or not doesn't really matter. It's just about like uh, throwing the trip as a threat mm -hmm. to get in the person's uh, mind to get them to rebalance. And while I'm trying to catch my balance, his his back to the outside where we have to like reset and restart the whole exchange again. Mm -hmm. So exactly what you said, like there are different tricks of the trade that you, you utilize against these fighters where like if, if you have just little things like, yeah, you're on the inside, you know, you're going to get clinched. You have to train for the things that might happen to you. So you're like, okay, I'm a long fighter. What do I have to watch out for? Oh, I'm a Muay Khao fighter. What do I have to watch out for? Which is going to be like, oh, the guys are going to be trying to teep me. You know, they're going to be trying to jab and move. Like, how do I cut off the ring so they can't move well? So you have to get, also get good at ringsmanship. It's not just this like beeline uh, for the opponent. And so same thing here. It's like we're both trying to uh, utilize our tactics on each other where I'm like, okay, I'm long. Okay. He wants to be in that like middle. Right. And then when he gets in that middle, I'm trying to get close to stuff it. Right. And then when I stuff, like he wants to, as in that transition, I can either land a knee or an elbow, or as I throw it, I can get off balance. And that's what he's trying to implement. So it, it, it's a really fun exchange of styles and like learning how to deal with each style that way. Yeah, it's good to have training partners with different styles so you're able to get a, a glimpse of every type of style. So when you get into the ring and you fight, uh, you have a little bit of experience in that sense. And then last but not least, we have the Muay Thai kind of fighter, which is a kicker. And it's kind of like a, a Muay Femur fighter in a sense because a Muay Femur fighter, uh, because their kicks are so good, they're very technical. They're able to score. And the same goes for the Muay Thai kind of fighter. Uh, the main... Uh, pros to this is obviously their kicks score really high in tie scoring uh, when it comes to body kicks and head kicks and even leg kicks. If you're able to land leg kicks and it, it actually like turns your opponent or shows some type of damage, then that type of stuff scores. Same with boxing. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, punches typically don't count, but if you see your opponent get rocked or there's any kind of like uh, tell that you you hit them and their neck shakes back or or something big and significant then that's scoring for you but with body kicks they'll score every time they land and so being a, a kicker uh as a thai stylist uh, as a muay thai fighter is going to benefit you especially in thailand because of just the way that the scoring scoring uh takes place yeah what i see as the main difference is uh the high iq fighter the muay femur has a lot more footwork they use more trickery mm -hmm. Versus the Muay Thai is more like uh, it's almost like that same mindset of the uh, Muay Khao that's, you know, relentless, but they're relentless with a different weapon. And it's yeah. and it's the kick and holding their ground, holding like really solid balance, almost like they're a statue uh, watching someone like the Davy brothers, like uh, Santos. Like I remember watching his fight and just being in awe of how many kicks he can throw, stand his ground, and how many he can check. There's a time where he, they go back and forth. I think there's an exchange of like eight kicks where he throws a kick, the other guy throws one. He doesn't try to lean back. He doesn't try to slide away. He doesn't try to catch it. He just slams his shin, his block into him, and then he blocks the kick as hard as he can. So just using the kick to shut down every aspect of the opponent's game and just holding like that hard balance uh hard structure and really strong foundation to just break the opponent down and uh you know sometimes they even take shots to the head uh, and return with the kick knowing that it they're holding their ground and then by kicking and scoring then they're ahead on the scorecards and then you know in round four and five then you can kind of back off and dance it off but i feel like with the femur they're they're they utilize more of the arsenal uh they don't stand their ground as hard they just use like high iq trickiness and being more evasive mm, that's a very good point so wrapping up here uh is there any so when it comes to these styles, so we just went over uh, six styles. Just a quick uh, review. Uh, Muay Mat fighter is kind of like boxing, aggressive uh, forward moving style. Got the Muay Thai fighter, who is a, a kick style. 
uh, Moy Femur, Femur fight. Well, I can't even talk. Moy Femur fighter, which is like the technical, evasive, well rounded fighter. Then we got the Moy Plum cl clinch fighter, uh, Moy Cow knee fighter, and Moy Thay, which is elbow fighter. So when it comes to creating oh, Moy your own style, Moy Stalk. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. My tie. Psh, fucking up. Anyway, when it comes to uh, creating your own style, What's one piece of advice or a couple of pieces of advice that you would give someone who's trying to form their own style of fighting? Well, this whole topic came about because we got an email from uh, Tommy McDermott. <laughs> I hope that I pronounced that right and we're allowed to use his name. Uh, <laughs> I'm a young Nak Moy looking for help. What, when is a good time to worry about your style in Muay Thai? For example, when should I concern myself with being a Muay Femur fighter or more of a Muay Cow style fighter? Thank you. Well, I think that focusing on everything and then uh, taking a good hard look at where your attributes lie, where your weaknesses are and where what your body type is, like which stance that you're in as well, because that's something that I felt like I was missing early on. So I think you should come with a well-rounded approach, meaning, you know, you're clinching every day, you're sparring every day, you, you're working on your low kick punching style, but you're also trying to have that like high scoring style of the kicks and still getting your 20, 30 minutes of clinching as often as possible. And then figuring out like what things are really natural to you and your body type because I felt like I didn't do that early on. I I more looked at what I enjoyed, what was the most entertaining, what made me feel like I'm in a fight, what I enjoyed watching, and I felt like it, this is what I enjoy watching. So this is the show that I want to give the people when I'm inside the ring. You know, wh when they're coming to watch me, uh, I want to be exciting, and that was the the main thing driving my style. Uh, versus looking at what my actual attributes are, being a tall, rangy southpaw, which I didn't look at until maybe two years ago. And this is out of a almost 10-year career now and 50 fights. So I've only fought this way probably for the last 10 fights or so. And even then, uh, going into uh, like things kind of like clicking, someone challenging me in the middle in the pocket and me wanting to exchange. So I, I do think you should have like a well-rounded approach. And when should you actually look at uh, you know, being like specialized, you know, you can look at this as like a doctor going through, you know, their general studies, they have to go through mm -hmm. the clinical, they have to be like a general practitioner at first. And then they spend their next four years, uh, you know, like uh, specializing in a different field, like orthopedics or whatever it may be. So uh, I would say once you feel proficient in everything, and then you have a good enough idea, maybe, maybe 10 fights or so in the West, you know, that seems to be like a decent amount where you kind of know where you're at after 10 fights, you, you kind of know where you're stand, you, you know, uh, like the nerves are gone. You can actually think a little bit inside the ring and outside the ring. You have enough experience where you can, uh, make a good enough choice, I guess. Beautifully said. I couldn't have said it better myself. I like the analogy of like going through school and getting your prerequisites in before you start to specialize in something. And I think that's the best way you can go about it is learn a little bit about everything, uh, get a good understanding of the, the general uh, requirements of being a good fighter. And then as you progress in your career, then you can start to specialize based off your attributes, like Paul said. So uh, hopefully this resonated with you. And hopefully uh, you're able to take a couple things from this and implement it into your training and your fight style. If anything just makes you think a little bit about what kind of style you want to implement into your own. But now we're going to jump into some questions. So we're doing this live on Facebook at the moment. So if you guys have any questions, drop them here. Uh, we have one super chat from Tom Berzaj. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Tom. But he was saying he started training Muay Thai and uh, and while he favored his right hand and leg, saying Southpaw feels a lot more natural to him. How would you go about learning technique as far as favoring one side? Appreciate you. So me personally, so I fight in both stances, so I'll uh, share my input on this. Um, I just make sure to train in both both stances. So like one day I'll train all orthodox, one day I'll train all Southpaw. Uh, maybe sometimes... In pads, I'll train orthodox and heavy bag, I'll train southpaw. Or maybe I'll alternate the rounds of sparring. One round is southpaw, one round is orthodox. And I'll just try to really focus on that. The thing is uh, that I noticed for me at least, 
was so I, I learned fighting orthodox and so all the techniques and everything i learned from orthodox but once i wanted to transition to southpaw and since it so, felt so weird at first i had to really think about like how to do it with proper technique and so honestly i feel like my southpaw uh fighting style is almost more technical than my right my orthodox fighting style however i feel like my orthodox fighting style is more powerful than my southpaw uh because of just the way that i work so my general piece of advice would just be training both stances uh kind of like uh, paul was just mentioning is like get a good understanding of every type of style and then you can kind of pick and choose what works best for you so like even though i fight southpaw um there's certain things i do a lot better southpaw than i do in orthodox and vice versa so although i can do everything in southpaw there's a certain few techniques or combinations that i use a lot that i know work and i just get really good at those and same idea with the clinch i actually uh kind of riffing off this a little bit um when it comes to the clinch a lot of people feel lost because there's so many different positions and there's not really any like you can watch videos on the clinch and everything but until you actually get inside there and start doing it it can be a little complicated to actually understand how things work when it comes to certain positions though me personally i i know like a few th there's the over under position there's a 50 50 there's a plum there's the double under hooks there's a few key positions that you find yourself in often and so in each of those positions i have like two or three good moves that I just rep out over and over and over again. And so if you're looking to fight Southpaw or Orthodox or whatever it may be, pick a few moves that you feel like you can get really good in and just drill the shit out of those and then start to add a little bit more variety to it just to, to mix it up and not let your opponent know exactly what you're going to do. Do you have any uh, general advice for this question as well, Paul? I believe that you should work from the stance that you feel like your foundation is the most stable. And that means like where you feel the most balanced, because I feel like the technique, the speed and the knowledge and everything else will come. But the stance itself should feel more solid, uh, whether you're standing South Pole or Orthodox. For some reason, I find my South Pole stance to just feel stronger. I feel more, um, I feel quicker when I'm orthodox and I'm right-handed. So I started uh, when I boxed uh, as a, an orthodox fighter because I have a heavy right hand. But then when it came to Muay Thai, you know, you have to focus on your balance a lot more. You're you're not as heavy on your legs and you can't be squatted down where the foundation is going to be strong no matter what. So going into Muay Thai where you have to be on your toes, you have to be a lot taller. I found that my foundation was a lot stronger from southpaw and my left leg was a lot heavier so when i skateboard i'm goofy when i snowboard i i stand goofy as well so as a southpaw and then when i kick like a soccer ball i feel that naturally my my left leg wants to hit so i, I would go from the stance that you feel more most foundationally sound and you can also like kind of cheat it that way the way i looked at it is you know i skateboarded for 10 years in, in in a southpaw stance i snowboarded everything came more natural i felt more balanced that way so that's the stance that i'm going to train and fight out of but i am right-handed and i feel like i i have the power to finish knockouts with my right hand but as a southpaw uh that doesn't really come you know that lead hook is really far away and the and the and is my jab so we're actually working on trying to figure out ways to transition just to hit those like heavy weapons so like if you do feel like your right kick is stronger but you feel more uh you feel like your stance is better as a southpaw then finding ways where you can make openings for those like heavy weapons to happen once you're a southpaw and to transition into the other stance but to spend the majority of it and your you know your defense your balance wh wh where it's most important is to stick to that one stance that you feel most stable in beautifully said so we have a question from him himanshu i hope I pronounced your name right he was asking about going to thailand to learn muay thai and which gym he should go to as a beginner i i made a whole uh whole video on it and i, I mentioned it in the comments as well uh that you should definitely check out because i think it's really important to do your own independent research but he also said that every gym says that they're good so he's confused so what do you look for in a gym when you're training in thailand and how do you go about uh figuring out which one you 
you should be going to? Well, the one that we're at here, the reason why I came here is because I was seeing that they place focus into every class. So being able to see that you are being directed and being instructed based on a certain focus rather than this cookie cutter approach where everyone does the same exact work and they're just smashing pads. Uh, you you want to see that people are being instructed uh, on, on, you know, it, you're not going to get that one on one attention that you would in a private lesson where someone's looking at you like, oh, Paul's a tall southpaw. This is what I need to teach him. But at least one that uh, focuses like, OK, Tuesday is more of like a boxing focus. This day is more of this focus and and looking at the team as a whole and how to build on it day to day. So uh, that's why I came here. That's what I always look for. But some guys really just look at gyms that just go fucking hard and they can figure those things out themselves. So you have to look for it. Uh, I, I mean, Diamond uh, does a really good job with beginners. That That's what I definitely notice is like they have like a really friendly environment that uh and and those trainers are really used to working with a lot of beginners from like literally zero experience and up to like uh amateur level you know so they have a ton of experience doing that so they're great at fixing those mistakes that you first start with yeah and i think it's just really important to, to research man like like yeah you can check out their websites and everything but ask around in facebook groups ask around in forums uh check out reviews on google on facebook and that kind of stuff obviously not all gyms are going to be that prevalent on social media and everything but when it comes to catering to foreigners and beginners they should have a, a decent uh uh, online presence in one form or another because that's who they're catering to so definitely just uh yeah use google google's your best friend um and don't overthink it because like it can be really paralyzing because there's thousands of gyms in thailand right uh just go and do it just go and do it find a gym that sounds about good and travel train there if you don't like it go to another gym right down the road and then you'll be fine you know um all right so next question we got is duology <laughs> well, we have a follow up where is here and uh, here uh, I just changed gyms to Powerhouse Phuket here oh. just a month ago, and it's uh it's been a like I'm I'm envious of uh Paul training there. I'm always been watching uh their Instagram and everything because of their training is so intentional, and so uh yeah they they're gonna do well, they're gonna do well, and I'm sure they'll uh, outlast this pandemic and then uh, be able to uh, really start to like scale and grow. But uh, Geology wants to know how do you develop the ability to read and view patterns better or just be better at countering? It's funny because I just finished an entire course on this in the Striking Academy. And uh, this is pretty much what I started to think about. Like, what is the most efficient way of learning something? Because I've, I've had things be taught to me in a million different ways. And then uh, my body, like think of the pattern, but then depending on what is in front of me, my brain couldn't register fast enough until I actually got into sparring for a long amount of time where I can make those adjustments, like to read people and, and their patterns. So I think if anything is just the drilling, what we talked about being really intentional with partners and, and developing these reflexes where you don't have to think about it anymore, because when you do, and you're thinking about one pattern, they may be already forming the next one and, and you're falling behind. So I think if, if you're prescribed good patterns by your coach and, and you're drilling with your partners to just have as many as possible, like when Sean and I were just training together, uh, I try to make it intentional every day to do like, okay, one round jab counters only one person's going the next round or like five and five, right? So like five jab counters, then the other person goes, then five cross counters, then the other person goes five kick counters and the other person goes. So then your brain just develops like, and, and then we do freestyle rounds. So then like they throw anything, but you're the counter fighter. So drilling it out like situationally like that is great. And then also forcing these habits uh, where you're building these patterns uh, on the heavy back. And that's what we just added on to the academy. Beautifully said. Now kind of uh, pivoting off of that in the same sense, we have another question about how to get better on the clinch and have a good entrance and don't be hit so much. Is there any correlation with everything you just said in regards to clinching and like the technical outside striking? I think you have to 
also think about it the way that wrestlers enter you know takedowns uh they can't just go from like that far long distance and then expect those short weapons which is the knees and the elbows to come into play unless you occupy space in that mid range and how we do that is by blinding our opponent with those long weapons so uh sean talked about it on the last podcast how he likes to utilize the teep to set up the knee so that's one way it, it's not blinding but it's a response that keeps your partner in place where they want to parry the teep they want to catch the teep and when you fake the teep and they take the second to stop in place and defend it that creates an opening for the entry for the knee and the elbow. So the teep fake is probably the most common, but you can also utilize a lot of blinding shots, like putting your hands in the opponent's face, uh, throwing combinations where they shell up and you can see they're more on the defensive side. So that way you can transition as they're uh, trying to defend. Well said. Uh, we got, we got one more question unless you have some questions on Instagram or anything. No, we, I, I just got up the story right before the podcast. So uh, we'll make sure that we get it up and and then also uh, let our Patreon people know so that we get questions in for that. Sweet. So last question then is Goran Saki wants to know which Muay Thai style works best for MMA? Oh, uh, that's a really good question uh, because I really like uh, Barboza's style and he has more of like this heavy switch like really fast uh switch kick style but i would say if you don't want to get taken down the 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 punch punch and low kick style that like more matt style is uh um less likely against a uh grappler for, for them to take advantage of especially if you have a quick pullback and really good setups uh there's a ton of guys that utilize the low kick in hands not a lot of people utilize the body kick in in mma but if you do want to study someone i would study barboza of how he is able to defend takedowns and how he is able to time i think his timing is really good on his body kicks that's why it's so hard to take him down off the body kick and i think most underutilized is that like more plum style where it's a lot of knees and elbows because you see those clinch situations on the cage a lot Mm -hmm. And uh, the first person that I finally saw do it was when Usman uh, fought Woodley. And I talked about this, how like I feel like guys don't do this enough where they threaten the takedown. And then they once the other guy drops their hips, come back up for the elbow. And then when they bring their hands back up, that's where you can get the takedown or land the knees and mix up those three levels where you're going after their legs for the takedown. Then you have the body for the knees. Then you have the head for the elbows. And he was able to utilize that perfectly. We have our guy, Will, from our gym, and he's a wrestler. And uh, how he got in the UFC is by getting an elbow knockout. And that's, you know, like you threaten wrestling. The guy goes for a shot himself, but the elbows are there to open up the opponent in the clinch situation. So I, I would say probably that, like, uh, Moy Plum style for sure. Yeah, I, I would say uh, more Mott uh, style because uh, the boxing and low kicks can help you with the aggressive uh, forward moving, especially because MMA uh, scoring definitely favors that that forward pressure and the, the volume of strikes. And also with low kicks as opposed to body kicks, they're less likely to get caught and they're less likely to be taken down in that sense as well. So that's my quick little tip. And then we'll do two more questions and then we'll wrap up. We have... Uh, <clears throat> This one, I, people, too many people are commenting now. So we got, I am wondering, just started Muay Thai before the pandemic, literally two lessons. Is it okay to follow your videos on YouTube or just keep practicing the few things you learned? You should do it all, man. You should do it all. And uh, I've been trying to do my best to create workouts that improve your technique because I've... Uh, stumbled across cardio kickboxing workouts with like millions of views and like all this shit and just complete garbage and like it's so bad and like you're learning these techniques and people are feeling like they actually know how to throw kicks or knees or punches and meanwhile it's just like it's like cardio movements it's not actual technique and so i'm doing my best to make sure that with the shadow boxing workouts with the body weight workouts with the heavy bag workouts that not only are you getting a good workout in but you're actually learning proper techniques so i would take what you already learned from your two lessons uh add some from my youtube channel and paul's Tech, uh, technique striking academy and then just trying to blend them all in together like obviously uh you can't 
you can't be in person one on one training, but you can supplement it with YouTube videos, with uh, technical analysis, with that kind of stuff. But it's up to you to be able to actually implement them and be your own coach and be your own student while you're actually trying to put them into play. Yeah, I, th I think it's good to blend uh, what you said is like if you have two things, uh, just rep it out, you know, thousands of times is is that quote. It's so cliche now, you know, like I, I fear not the man that practiced 10,000 kicks, but the man that practiced one kick 10,000 times, which is actually not that much 10,000 times. So put in that 10,000, just focusing on certain things of like actually getting your hip through, utilizing your hip rather than like buckling underneath it and, and doing it with good balance. And then you can add the tricks of the trade on top of it. Boom. Uh, last question, not trolling, but what's y'all's thoughts on smoking marijuana? And so I have a little bit more experience in this department. Yeah. So <laughs> I will take over. Um, I think that, I mean, I'm okay with everything in moderation. When I'm training for a fight, obviously I'm cutting out weed. Um, if anything, I'm just doing some now, nowadays, CBD uh, to help sleep and that kind of stuff. But uh, smoking marijuana, definitely I can feel it affect my cardio slightly. And it also uh, makes me drag ass a little bit more that being said i've had uh sessions where i've smoked right before a session and i fucking crush it and i'm like in the matrix and shit and so like everyone is very different i'm not condoning uh smoking or drugs or any kind but it's up to you to uh figure out what works best for you um i i do feel like i mean you, you see guys like nick and nate diaz who obviously are, are smokers and they have the best cardio in the game but that doesn't like what would happen if they didn't smoke? Would they have even better cardio? Like there's always these uncertain uh, answers uh, to these questions and everything, but it's all kind of based on your preference. When it comes to just uh, training Muay Thai, like as long as you're not competing, I don't see it much of an issue. And even when you are competing, as long as you're doing it uh, like consciously and not abusing it and doing it with like reason. Like when I when I smoke weed and I'm training for a fight. I use it as a relaxation tool to help me uh, sleep, to help me unwind because I'm, I'm very ADD. I very, I very much have to always be doing something. And so this helps me do nothing. And so that's usually, uh, that's my philosophy. Obviously it's uh, evolved and changed over time. Uh, but I think it's just a matter of just, if you do smoke experimenting with like, and actually like journaling, like how, how you felt, uh, this week after smoking X amount or how you felt going to training before uh, uh, or after you smoked and how that actually worked out for you. So uh, try it out, see how it goes, but there's no right or wrong answer. There's no right or wrong answer to anything. All right. It's just a matter of uh, trying to figure out what works best for you. Boom. You know, I like what you said there is that you do it with intention. And I feel like sometimes you have people that are very successful that they have certain habits that uh a lot of people already have but they're not really doing shit so the second that someone that's successful like says like yeah man it's all it, it's okay to do it, do it. <laughs> yeah they they see it as like a green light to like continue like oh there's nothing wrong with me doing this and stuff like that but it's like one thing that might be great for one person it doesn't exactly mean that it's you know uh, a positive thing for another because i know a ton of people that uh do do it and it helps them especially with like anxiety if they're like highly wired like a person person with a personality like mine for sure should i don't because i do have an addictive personality and i feel like whatever i get into i get into like really deep so i feel like it might like put me over on the other side <laughs> where i would be a little bit too lax like I, it would take the edge off me a little bit too much and i i'd like then i go deeper into that mm -hmm. like I, uh I, i've talked to you about this before that like i i like the stress in a way like i hate it i hate it but i know it makes me do things mm -hmm. i feel like whenever i i do something to take the edge off uh, I've become a little bit too complacent, like like allowing myself to do it. Uh, me kind of talking shit to myself uh, helps me uh, as stressful as it can be sometimes. Like Mia was, she read one of my notes the other day. I had like a to-do list. And on top of it, she's like, 
who are you sending this to? Because it said like you need to do this motherfucker, like blah 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 blah. Stop being a bitch and blah blah blah. This this has to get done first. And she's like, "What is this?" And I was like, "Oh, that no, it's fine. It's just me talking to myself. So like, I get that done first because it's the last thing I want to do. So I'm, you know, kind of challenging myself. <laughs> yeah, kind of like riffing off that. I was actually just talking with Liz because like. Um, just talking about motivation and getting shit done going off on a little sidetrack right here is like, I write to myself similarly to how you write to yourself. And I talk to myself in the same way, but when it comes to like, uh, Liz, for example, she needs to be much more loving and like, ex like, okay with things and it can't be forceful. It can't be like the overly masculine thing and so i think when it comes to like motivation and everything you have to figure out the best ways to motivate yourself so you have to figure out the best ways to talk to yourself and like when it comes to like training and showing up and everything or even just kind of going with the weed thing whether or not you actually uh should use it or not you really have to like i mean paul you're a big writer i'm a big writer and a lot of the stuff that i write i mean if i showed you my notebook it's the same shit like almost every fucking day it's just like it's just like the same to do's it's the same habits i want to build it's the same goals it's the same shit and it's just building these uh neural pathways that are helping me stay on point keep uh connected with my vision and everything as well so yeah i just wanted to, to mention that that like learning how to talk to yourself whether it's with the tough love like we do or more of the soft love like uh my wife does i think it's really important to find what works best for you and to really just like delve deep into that shit so thank you guys all for all the great questions always uh fun to jump on this uh before we wrap up paul what you got for us just what i mentioned before uh if you're looking for that prescription when it comes to learning technique then drilling then taking like a step-by-step -step process we started applying this process to all our new content that we're putting out in the striking academy you can find that multitechnician.com slash striking academy we have a ton of new members people signing up so uh it makes me want to dive that much more deep into a lot of these details and uh formulate like a system around it so that's exactly what we're doing here like starting you off from muay thai 101 if you don't know the technique going from the technique to the drills you can utilize then going into patterns pathways then going into like how you can drill it out by yourself or with a partner and then finally taking that that last step of like how to implement it in a fight so like different tricks like different situations that you're faced with depending on stance and style fighter that you're facing and how to implement it that way so we'll have a lot more stuff coming with that keep a lookout for uh a clinch mastery manual that sean is featured in as well as a guest and um yeah that, that's pretty much it and uh check us out on patreon for the podcast so patreon.com slash muay thai guys no the just slash muay thai guys check us out on there so that way you know your question is going to get answered on the next one how about yourself sean Boom. Well said. Yeah. Just check out MuayThaiGuy.com, KnockMuayNation.com. I have uh, new gloves. Uh, these are sexy. I'm enjoying these very much so. They're double strap. If you're listening to the podcast, obviously you can't, but you can hear it. You can hear the sexiness of the, the Velcro and the double strap. Oh, nice. Yeah. 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 So uh, I find that these so are like a hybrid of regular gloves and lace-ups because they feel – uh comfortable like a, a re well they feel comfortable like both gloves but they feel more secured like lace us because of the double uh double strap and so i've been using them getting a good uh feel for them and i'm excited to uh have them for sale eventually um hopefully they'll be ready for uh black friday and yeah i'm, I'm super pumped about that so check out the shop always got new stuff coming on like this knock more nation shirt and tank tops and all that good stuff but uh yeah you'll hear more from us in the next week next month next however long we continue on doing this shit as long as you guys keep showing up we'll keep showing up as well 
And uh, yeah, it's much appreciated. And also, if you guys get a chance, one thing we've neglected is a uh, trying to get podcast reviews. If you guys are enjoying this podcast, uh, please leave a review either on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify, wherever you can. It'd be greatly appreciated. We'll give you a shout out on the podcast and uh, we'll probably end up doing some type of contest or for a free shirt or something as well. So uh, mm. do that and you'll be entered to win whatever contest we come up with and it would be very much appreciated. So, uh, yeah. Any last words, Paul? Beautiful. I'm six foot four to answer everyone's question. We're the Muay Thai 